And I want us to imagine that these are the words from Jesus himself, just to remind us that he is there for us. When you're feeling down And it just seems your world is falling all around No need to fear I will be there To love you your friends are gone and it just seems your world is falling all around i'll dry your tears i will be there to love you even though sometimes you feel it hurts to be alone but i know that one day soon all the pain will be behind us no more sadness will find us will find us remember this it won't be long we will be together and we'll be going home. This call is being transcribed. Until that day when we meet face to face, we're going to sing about the miracle of grace. I love you. Sometimes you feel it hurts to be alone, but I know that one day soon all the pain will be behind us. No more sadness will find us, will find us. Remember this. It won't be long, we'll be together, you just keep holding on, until that day, when we meet face to face, we're gonna sing about the miracle of grace. But until then, know this, my friend, I love you. God, praise God, praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Felicia, for that beautiful, beautiful song. We give God praise. We give God praise. Praise God. And at this time, I am going to welcome Sister Anita, who will be bringing us the special word tonight. Praise the Lord. We just want to say welcome, Sister Anita, to the Button to Christ prayer line. We welcome you tonight as we prepare to hear the word that the Lord has given you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Can you hear me? Praise God. Praise God. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Loud Thanks. and clear. Okay. Happy Sabbath to everyone on the prayer line. It's been a blessing just listening to the praise report. Um, just, just so blessed this evening. And so grateful for the mercies of God. He's kept us. He's watched over us. And there's so much, like everyone has said before, so much to thank the Lord for. Do I just go ahead and proceed? Yes, Sister Anita, you, you okay. may go right ahead. Oh, All right. Thank you so much. 
So friends, tonight it, it's the dawn of another Sabbath or the eve of, or the beginning, I should say, of another Sabbath. And the Lord has truly, truly shown his faithfulness and shown how merciful he is. Even in the midst of a chaotic world, God has been faithful. And as I pondered through this week as to what the message would be tonight, God, through his spirit, inspired me to to surround my um, message tonight on the theme, Dare to Ask for More. Dare to Ask for More. Everyone knows in history that Alexander the Great was a mighty king and a fierce conqueror. Even though he lived around 300 BC, his reputation today still lives on as the conqueror of the entire known world in his time. The story, however, um, is quite different. There's an aspect to his to to the history we know about Alexander um, that people don't often um, know about. So the story goes that when he realized there was nothing left to conquer after Asia, he actually wept. Now, besides being a great conqueror, he was a compassionate leader. He was very, very compassionate to his people. Every year, he set aside one day, which he called the Compassionate Day. Apparently, he would randomly select people across his kingdom who would come and ask him for a special request and something that they believe he alone could grant them. And whatever it was, whatever their request was, he would fulfill it. Isn't that amazing? However, most people were timid in front of, most persons were timid in front of him. And when they thought of how great and mighty um, he, he, he was as a king, uh, they would ask for things like food and clothes or money for medicine. However, one year, things went a little different. One man shared his special request to the king's spokesman. And this is what he said. Could you please tell the king, I would like a large palace, a very large palace. And I want it to be with a large banquet hall with a big meal to host all my friends. The spokesman stopped him with irritation and answered, Is that a request? How dare you? What impertinence! Don't you see all the other people asking for food and medicine? How dare you ask the king for such a large item like a palace? King Alexander noticed the commotion and asked his spokesman, What does this man want? The spokesman, reluctantly, friends, turned around toward the king and whispered so only he could hear, King, I'm so sorry to tell you this. This man is being completely unreasonable, and I know you will be upset. But he's asking for a palace, not just any palace, but one with a large banquet hall. Because apparently, he has a lot of friends. Also, he wants the whole thing set up with a big meal furnished with lavish food. I'm so sorry, he insisted. Even though I told him it was unreasonable, he kept insisting. The king paused for a moment. Then all of a sudden, with a big smile, Alexander the Great turned toward the petitioner and happily said, Request granted. The spokesman's jaw dropped. But but how can you grant such an outrageously large request? The king smiled and said, 
You see, all these people are asking for food, for medicine, for mundane types of things that anyone really could give them. They think that's the only thing I can give. But they don't need a king to give them these things. Anyone with extra money or extra goods could do that. But a king, or as a king, for the first time, this man has made me feel like the king that I am. For only a king could grant such a request. Wow. If an earthly potentate could think this way, what about our God? Our Heavenly Father is the God of the universe. Imagine, imagine how much our Father owns. He owns so much that even the very breath that we breathe, it's from Him. The scripture tells us that our God is not limited in what He can supply. It says, my God shall supply all, not some, but all my needs according to his riches in glory. And friends, if you don't know tonight, I'm here to reassure you that he has vast riches. We could ever fathom the riches that our Heavenly Father has. But you may be asking, why am I sharing this story? about Alexander the Great. You see, making a request to the king is associated to how we make requests to our God. And that we do that through prayer. There is a very, very well-known scripture that I have been pondering on for some time now. And the Lord has been just revealing more and more um, powerful truths to that, this scripture. And that is that scripture is found in Second Chronicles chapter seven verses fourteen and fifteen, and we all know it so well. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be opened. And mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now let's put this scripture into context. We're talking about daring to ask for more. Praying differently. And we've all been praying throughout these seven days of fasting. I know a lot of prayers have been going up, prayers of faith, prayers lifting our needs and our petitions to God. So let's examine the context of this scripture. King Solomon, all the children of Israel, under God's leading, have completed the work on this permanent and magnificent temple for God. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God's guidance, they've worked tirelessly to build this temple. Finally, the day arrives when the work is completed and they have all assembled for the dedication of the temple. Solomon prays, And in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1, we read, When Solomon finished praying, fire descended from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God has always used fire to identify his presence and to purify or set apart his people. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. You would remember that, right? And he said to Moses, the place where you are standing is holy ground. To Elijah, he manifested his power and presence by consuming his sacrifice on the altar with fire, a spectacle. 
miracle was it? To the disciples who were in Jerusalem in the upper room, God manifested his presence through the Holy Spirit in tongues of fire. It is not surprising that God declared also to John the Baptist that I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Yes, beloved, God desires to manifest his presence in the lives of his children by baptizing us with the fire of the Holy Spirit. In order to receive this fire, there are special requirements that we must meet. This fire is, is linked to true worship. In order to understand the requirements of being baptized with the fire of God, let us dissect the scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The scripture begins with the words, If my people, which are called... By my name. The first point we should all get tonight is that God has a name. Exodus 33, verses 17 to 19 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So here we see. Moses has asked God to show him his glory. And in God wanting to reveal his glory to Moses, God says, listen, I will pass by. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim my name. In Exodus 34, we read, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Now he's proclaiming his name. And here is the name of the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And tonight I listen to the testimonies and I listen to the various ways that God showed his goodness, that God revealed his truth, that God was merciful, that God was gracious. Beloved, this is how God reveals his character to us, this is the name of God. Keeping mercy for thousands, the scripture continues. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. God reveals his name to Moses in the scripture. We just read. And as I said, what was his name? His name is his character. Notice that there are many instances in scripture where important significance is placed on a name. Take, for example, Jesus' birth. Before Jesus came to this earth, his name was already mentioned to his parents. In Matthew 121, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why that name? Because he shall save his people from their sins. God's character is wrapped up in his name, or may I say, his names. He is our Redeemer. He is merciful, long-suffering, forgiven, abundant in goodness and truth. So, beloved, when we dare to ask God for more, when we're approaching God in prayer, we need to know which God we're calling on. We need to know him by name. We need to know his character and believe when he says he is who he is. 
The second point is that God has a people. In fact, a special people who are set apart. And how do I know this? First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says, But he, let me paraphrase here, but we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who have called us from where? Out of darkness into his marvelous light which in the past, in time past, were not a people, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Isn't that beautiful? The text starts, if my people, God has a people who are called by my name, God has a name, and therefore we and God in, in identifying our God and who we are in him, we must reveal the character of the God we serve. From the moment we renounce sin, beloved, and the world, and we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become his people. It is based on this foundation that we have the privilege to approach the great God of this universe and dare to ask him for more. But sadly, many of us do not understand that. And it is not just about bearing his name or knowing his name. When we approach God, we must present ourselves as he demands or requires. This takes us to the other part of the scripture. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. We cannot approach God without humility. Humble themselves is a statement of position. In the story of Jacob and Esau, we see Jacob humbling himself to be reconciled with his brother Esau. This same position is needed in reconciling our relationship with God. When we humble ourselves, beloved, we bend low, we prostrate, we fall to the ground. It is worth remembering the root word of humility is humus, meaning dirt or soil. So this points us to the lowest of low. We need to meet God on our knees. Like the sides of the same coin, a humble person not only sees himself or herself, herself as they are lowly and desperate, they see God as he really is majestic, sovereign, omnipotent, and gracious. We see a God who too humbled himself on a cross so that he could be in a relationship with us. How beautiful this is, beloved. When we follow the prayers of the many faithful and godly men and women of the Bible, we will find one common denominator. They all humbled themselves before God. They presented themselves in humility of heart. Look at the countless prayers that David prayed. Who, someone who always approached God with the words, Have mercy upon me, O God. Why is it important to approach God in prayer with humility? Well, here's what the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And Psalms 10 verse 4 says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Think about it. It was pride that got us into this mess in the first place. Satan, through pride, chose to rebel against the Most High. He chose to be lost 
and to bring destruction upon all those who will allow pride into their lives. Pride prevents us from reaching God or, or, or it barricades us from God, if you will. To receive answers to prayer, to receive forgiveness and healing, we must renounce pride completely and approach God in humility. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister Anita, are you there? Just want to make sure you were done before I start taking the prayer request. I think she got finished. Can you hear me now? Yes, I don't think she got finished. I think she got yes. disconnected. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Thank God. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Sister Anita. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, friends. We're looking at praying now. When we have a humble heart or when we approach God in humility, the invitation is given to pray. Prayer indicates relationship. It is driven by our need to communicate with the God whom we love and trust. When we pray, we simply tell our big God our big problems. Or we tell our Creator what's on our mind. It is through prayer we grow our relationship with God and open before Him our desires, our needs, our wants, or our anxieties, our worries, or our fears. When we pray, this is us talking to the Lord. This leads us to the other part of the scripture, which is God talking back to us. It says, pray. Then seek my face. Some may believe that seeking God's face means praying to him. I beg to disagree. When we pray, this is equivalent to a one-way conversation. God listens and we're speaking. But when we seek God's face, this is deeper. When we talk of relationship, this is where he answers back to us. Interestingly, The Hebrew word for face in the Old Testament is often translated present. When we seek the face of God, we are seeking his presence. Seeking God's face is the intent to know him intimately to the extent that we are one with him. A fact that brings this scripture to mind, if you abide in me and my words, because we find God, we seek him in his word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, guess what? When we talk about daring to ask ask for more, then he shall ask what you will, and it shall be given to you. This type of abiding speaks to an amazing relationship with the Lord. How do we seek God's face? Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Psalm 9, 10 says, and those who know your name put their trust in you. See, it goes back to the beginning of the scripture that God has a name. And those who know your name put their trust in you for you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who Seek you, I say, Thank praise you. God tonight. Amen. Hebrews eleven six says, and without faith it is impossible to please Him. To please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who who, who do what who seek Him. God rewards us for seeking after Him, for longing for Him, desiring Him, that we can. Open his word and say, Father, reveal yourself to me. You've heard my plea. You've heard my prayer. Lord, 
speak to me, Father. Speak. Not don't wait on the pastor to tell us what the Lord wants to say to us. Don't rely on the people around us. Let us seek God because He's so interested in communing with us intimately, beloved. And then God says, and here is the equation, you know. God says, here are the four things I need you to do. Humble yourself, pray, seek my face, and turn from your wicked ways. Turn from the evil way shows the direction of our walk toward God. The theological word for turning from our wicked, sinful, unholy lifestyle and walking toward God is repentance. Repentance means to turn around. It is to say, Lord, you know what? I'm going in the wrong direction. I need to turn from my wicked ways and turn to you. Many times we can't do this on our own. But once we pray to God about what's difficult and we seek his faith, his word will remind us of how he is great and sufficient, how he's able to live out his life in us. Beloved, it's not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of God that we overcome. And so why does God bid us to turn from our wicked ways? This is so important in us reaching out to God in prayer and, 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 and waiting on him for answers. Why? Because Isaiah 51 verses 1 and 2 says, Behold. The Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your iniquities have separated between you and me, have made, sorry, a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God wants to hear us so much, friends. God wants, he longs to hear us when we pray. And so he's saying, turn from your evil ways, repent, forsake your sin, confess your sin. Beloved, when we come before God, let us come with a clean heart. And, and, and when I say clean heart, come as we are, but say, Father, clean me up. That when we open our mouths to seek him and pray, we can be heard. Psalm 24 verses 3 and, um, to 6 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? If we want to experience that holy fire, if we want to experience the presence of Almighty God, this is the question. How can you stand in his presence? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And John um, chapter 9 verse 31 says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. There are prayers God can't hear. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. We must approach God seeking forgiveness of sin because sin separates us from God. And beloved, Satan knows this truth and its powerful implications. So he works with all vigor to keep us in a state of sin. That way he is sure that we are praying empty prayers or prayers that will not be heard. This is all God asks of us. When we meet these conditions, his awesome love, power, and grace is revealed. And finally, God does his part. He says, then will I hear from heaven. Beloved, God longs to hear our prayers. He yearns to answer our prayers. He wants us to dare to ask for more, and he wants to do more for us, beloved. When we humble ourselves, commune with God, desire his presence, turn from our iniquity, God surrounds us with his magnificent presence. It is at this point that we can dare to ask for more, more of his love, more of his wisdom, more of his miracle working power, more of his grace, 
more of a knowledge of him, more of his goodness and more of his character. Oh, friends, John 9 verse 31 says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. I'm going over this text again. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And God says, listen, I will forgive your sin. Forgiveness of sin should be our ultimate desire. This should come before our need for physical healing or financial blessing. Being made right with God, for this is what forgiveness is all about. It should it ignite a fire within us, oh, oh beloved. And that fire, I am sure, no demon in hell can put out. Satan, the accuser, may look at us to, to fault us and to, to flaunt our sins in, in the face of God, but he will not find our sin. And just quickly, friends, I remembered an encounter I had when I was very young, and I did not know what demon possession was at that time to that extremity or, or that extent. And I recall I had, I, I was um, probably in my early 20s and I had a friend whom I was asked to pray for and she needed prayers because I was studying psychology and her, her family needed somebody who understood the mind to speak with her and so not understanding what was happening I prayed with this young lady who I met with her and only to find out the demon manifested so here I am um I had not been doing right by the Lord. I had, you know, been engaging in acts that I know I should not have engaged in. And I'm being real with you tonight. As a sinner, there I am and I'm encountering a demon in a child of God, in, in a beautiful young lady. And all I remembered is the word of God saying, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And beloved, when I saw what was happening, I just whispered a prayer quietly in my mind. And I said, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I claim your word. I ask for cleansing. I confess my sins. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. And beloved, that encounter truly revealed to me the promises of God in a manner I will never forget. And many people who deal with guilt from sin, I usually encourage them with this experience. When the demon began to speak after I had prayed, the demon spoke and said to those who were around praying with this young lady, and the demon said, you don't think I know you all? You think I don't know you all? But beloved, there was no fear. When that demon began to threaten like it was going to reveal sins or unmask things hidden in darkness, I was I had this peace enveloping me, surrounding me. I was feeling the peace and the presence of God from that simple prayer. And then that demon said, all of you, you think I don't know you all? All of you have the spirit of God. When I left that place, that evening, I pondered deeply on that and I said, Father, your word is true. If that demon could have seen my sin, he would not hesitate to, to use it against me. But you did what only you can do and you are keeper of your promise. When God says, as far as the east is from the west, so shall he remove our transgression from us. He did it for me that night. When the Lord says, In to the deepest parts of the ocean, I will bury your sin, he did it for me that night. I don't know how he did it, beloved. All I know is that that demon could not see my sin. It was covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I say, praise God for that. Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 31, um, 32, sorry, verse 1 says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
And I, beloved, can tell you about that. And the final part of the scripture says, God will heal our land. Jeremiah 30, 70 says, but I will restore to you health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, who, by whose stripes we were healed. Notice it didn't say, we will be healed. It says, we were healed. Beloved, the healing is already made, been made available. God has already sent forth his word. His word just needs to come alive in our lives by us claiming that word by faith and daring to ask him for more. Let us not settle for less than what God wants to give. He is the king of the universe. And beloved, if Alexander the Great could have been so surreal that someone asking him for something that only a king could give, let us dare to ask our God for more. And Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 says, But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And, and, and tonight, I remember Sister Walters sharing her testimony here and telling us about, you know, the pains. Sister Walters, there's healing in the wings and, and just fear God's name and stand up by faith and healing is ours in Jesus' name. And so, friends, one of the saddest, saddest scenes is the burning embers of, of churches that have been burned to the ground. What if we saw similar headlines? church on fire because its members demonstrated a purity of holiness an intensity in worship and a passion for witness wouldn't it be awe-inspiring if the fire of god's presence fell upon his people in extraordinary measure wouldn't it be attractive if our churches caught on fire spreading god's message to their communities and beyond you know what would happen People would come just to watch us burn. And I'm not talking about physical burning. I'm talking about burning for Jesus. Church buildings will not attract many people, but fire in the hearts of holy people who worship and witness in them will. Christians who carry large Bibles will not attract many people. But people who are right with God and who leave what the word says will. Is your heart aglow tonight? Are you on fire for Jesus tonight? Step out of your comfort zone. Come higher, beloved, tonight. And dare to ask God for more. More than you have ever asked him before. And wherever you are on the prayer line, just bow your head with me as I pray. Great God of heaven, maker of the heavens and the earth, king of the universe, we bow humbly in your presence tonight, asking you to cleanse us, Lord, asking you to give us more of you, help us to thirst for you, to seek you, to find you through your word, to experience your power, your presence like we have never experienced it before. Lord, we pray that this scripture will become real in our lives, that we, your people who are called by your name, teach us to humble before you, to pray, to seek your faith. Father, help us to turn from our evil ways that you may hear our prayers. You will forgive our sins and you will heal us, Lord. Father God, touch your people tonight. Whatever the needs are, reach out and meet the needs of your children, not because we deserve it, but because you are faithful. We thank you for your word tonight, Lord. 
We thank you for who you are. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would put enmity in our hearts for the things of this world, for sin, and for all the things that so easily beset us. And put love, Lord, love, love in our hearts for the things of you. For you, O oh God, deserve all that we are, all that we have, and all that we can ever offer. Take our lives tonight. Take all of us, Lord, and transform us into the image of your beautiful, precious, most blessed Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hear our prayer tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 